We're going verse by verse through 1 Timothy, and we've already been five weeks through only 10 verses, 10 or 11 verses. So we're going very slowly through the book. Um, but man, for me, it's like just eating some very rich delicacy. I, I, just, I just love going through 1 Timothy. We haven't been in Paul's epistles for a while. In every passage, it seems like there's, there's a lot of good information in there to remind us of. And it doesn't stop here with the passage tonight. Uh, as we often quote 1 Timothy 1.16 uh, to describe Paul being the pattern for us, and yet it's so oft ignored. I was reading commentaries and, and different teachers who teach through the book, and they'll acknowledge Paul's special uh, conversion of grace, but they won't acknowledge the pattern that the Lord made him for us in the church today. And so we'll go to cover that tonight and what import Paul has in his, his own salvation, uh, salvation testimony toward the church today and what his place is in the church. Okay? So you recall last week, we, in the greater context of the chapter, Paul is exhorting Timothy about how to establish this church, uh, this pillar in the ground of the truth, and how they ought to behave in it. And the first thing he tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 1.3 is to charge some that they teach no other doctrine. And so Paul says, first and foremost of importance in the local church is doctrine. If they're teaching wrong doctrine, another doctrine than that which, which Timothy had received, uh, he was to charge them to stop. Okay? And uh, of the other doctrines that were being influential in Timothy's church at Ephesus here were the fables in verse 4, the endless genealogies in verse 4, and there were some who desired to teach the law. Okay. Now the law, we covered last week in detail, is a biblical teaching. It's from the Bible. And so you may have Bible churches or Bible people say, well, I'm quoting the Bible, and the Bible says this or that. But it's not enough just to be biblical. We have to be dispensational. Right? We have to understand who God is speaking to. You can quote from the Bible as the devil did. Quote from the Bible and be exactly wrong. Okay? You can quote from the Bible and you're trying to put people under the law, and you'll rob them of the riches that God has for us in this dispensation. So we covered that in detail last week. We, we had, what, 20, 25 different consequences of putting us back under the law. Okay, the law of which God gave Israel to teach them a lesson, to ordain them as a nation, to sanctify them, and yet Paul teaches that we're not under the law. Okay, Paul says that uh, we're under grace. And we covered that in Romans 10 and in Romans 6 last week. Okay. And so when Paul says there's those who desire to be teachers of the law, and he calls their teaching vain jangling, that's in contrast to what they think is an important teaching. And we covered on Sunday the testimony, the, the false testimony that someone sent me um, online about uh, how they thought salvation was by their commandment, keeping. They're following the commandments uh, of Jesus and, and the Bible and so forth. Um, and that is vain. You cannot. See, that's what the law teaches us, the knowledge of sin. If there's one thing that we ought to learn from the law is that we cannot live up to its perfect standard. That's why God offered sacrifices as part of the law system, because uh, they were going to fail. See, So we learn that. And so in verse 8, Paul says, We know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. And this is often an scapegoat for Christians who, who still want to utilize that stick that club of the law to manipulate and, and force people to do things, to obligate them to do things. They'll use that law. And they'll say, well, I'm using it lawfully. I'm not using it unlawfully, but lawfully. But what does that mean to use the law lawfully? What does that mean? We already know the law has a purpose of showing the knowledge of sin. We already know the law was given to establish the nation of Israel. We know the law was given as a purpose to, uh, in shadows and types, speak of Christ. We spoke out on Sunday about the temple of skin being a shadow of Christ and the, the, the lambs there being a shadow of Christ. So it does all of that. But in what use is the law to us today? We're not Israel. We're not under the Old Testament. We have something far more excellent than that law. Christ and Paul himself said so. Paul says Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to those that believe. So what purpose does the law have, have for us? And the answer is none. There is no application of the law to you in this dispensation. No practical participation in the law. We look at the law as if we were looking at uh, a jurisdiction from another country. We can look at Canada's laws or look at Mexico's laws or England's laws. And we read about those. We learn from them. We, we, can, we can see them from a distance. But you're not under their jurisdiction. You're not under their power. And of course, the difference is we're not talking about some earthly system of laws. We're talking about God's laws here. And so they are esteemed and good in that regard. So we can read Israel's laws and say, look at, look at this good law God gave this nation. But you don't live in that country. Okay? You're not under its power. 
You're not under its dominion. It has no control over you. And that's what Paul spends detail in Romans 6 describing. Okay, Romans 6 and 7. And so when he says there's a, a lawful use of the law, we need to understand that the law is a stick. It cannot help you. It can only beat you up because you are a sinner. You see, that's the law's is, is, is only use. And so to use the law lawfully, uh, the only way you would use this law is to bring someone to Christ. That's it. It's to show them the need for Jesus Christ. Well, let me say it that way. You cannot get someone saved by the law, so I don't mean it that way. I mean, you point them to the law and say, look at this law. Don't you know you're a sinner? And when you get to the point of them saying, well, I need something else. The law is inadequate. I need something else to save me besides this law. That's where you say, oh, Christ is the answer. See, so the law plays no role in salvation. The law plays no role in your living. Okay. Some people make a distinction between the moral law and the ceremonial law. Have you ever heard this distinction? Well, the, the, there's the law back there, 613 points, and, and part of it's ceremonial with the tassels and the, the clothing and, and some of these things they do in the temple. This is ceremonial law. The, in the Sabbath day, some people will include that in there as well. And then there's the moral law. The moral law, like honor your father and mother. You know, don't bear false witness, things like this. These are, these are moral teachings that um, are still binding on everybody. You know, we're, we're still under the, that law jurisdiction. So if we disobey one of those commandments, the moral commandments, we're still subject to judgment and wrath of it. Okay? Well, that's not true. Like you're not under the law. You're not under the power and condemnation of it. Is it true that we still ought to honor our father and mother? Is that still a righteous thing? Yes. If we do, do we get rewarded? We're not under its blessings. If we don't, do we get cursed? We're not under its curse. It's something you ought to do. In fact, Paul says that in Ephesians 2, verse 10. He says, you're saved by grace through faith, but we've been saved and ordained to do good works, as we should do them. We ought to do them. But doing right, do you reward your kids for not speaking back at you? Do you reward children for just doing what they ought to do? You see, it's just the right thing they ought to do. The law communicated that we, as humanity, could not do even the, 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 the briefest uh, list of God's righteous standards. You see? And so, the law, is, what Paul's not doing here is making a distinction between the moral and ceremonial, saying, well, the ceremonial law is gone, we're under the moral law, so use it lawfully, meaning you've know, you got to make that distinction in the law so that only certain laws apply. No one's doing it all. The whole law is disregarded. Okay? James says in James 2.10 that if you're guilty of breaking one point of law, you're guilty of all. Right? If you break just one point, the whole law it go, is, is, is a package. It comes together. Okay? And so Paul's not making a distinction there, neither should we. So again, what's he mean here by uh, using the law lawfully? Can we use the law at all? Right? Paul says in Galatians 3 that the law teaches that those who keep it, uh, the law requires that you do that which it says to do. It requires that if you keep it and do it, you'll live. That's what Leviticus 18 says. If you keep it and do it, you'll live. Deuteronomy 6.25 says it'll be your righteousness if you keep the law. We saw last week in Deuteronomy 32 that it's not a vain thing. It is your life to do this law, Deuteronomy 32. That's what the law taught. And the whole point of what Paul's teaching and the change of dispensation to this dispensation of grace is that the law is no longer God's means for telling us how to live. The law is no longer God's means of teaching people righteousness. The law is no longer any help or use to anybody in this dispensation. We are past that dispensationally in God's revelation. You say, well, what are we to replace this with? A lot of people think when we talk like this, we talk about God's grace and talk about the law and we're not under it, they immediately think in their mind, we, we mentioned this last week as well, in their legalistic mind, that if we remove the law and replace it with nothing, sinners are going to run chaos and you're giving a license to sin. If you tell people that we're not under the law of honoring your father and mother, what are they going to do? dishonor their father and mother is what they think okay this is a legalistic mindset and it also is a denial of the revelation of god's grace because it's not that god said through paul get rid of the law do whatever <laughs> okay what he did is christ came in the flesh and then he dispensed his grace to the apostle paul and it was this new information that paul says because of this new information the law is made old we're not under it because of this new information you say, God's grace is the way you live now. God's grace is the way you live in righteousness. 
And this is what Paul communicates in his epistles. To Romans, he describes that you're not under the law, but you're under grace. In the book of Corinthians, the Corinthians took, took the idea of not being under the law, meaning we can do whatever we want. And Paul says, that's not what grace teaches. That's not what grace teaches to, to the Corinthians. Grace is not a license to sin. Grace is not an excuse. Right? Grace is our example. Grace should be an example to others. Grace is what, so he rebukes the Corinthians. Right? To the Galatians, they still have the self-righteous idea that even though they're saved by grace, we need to continue in works and continue under this law to live our life. So grace is for salvation, but law is for life. And Paul says, no, in fact, I'm kind of scared of you Galatians, Galatians chapter 4, because if you think the law has anything to do with the way you live your life, then maybe you think it has something to do with how you got there in the first place, with your salvation. Right? So he says, I'm scared of you. If you're saved by grace, you walk by grace, your whole life is defined by grace. That's what Paul says. And more specifically, knowing that grace is a word that Christians use and people battle over the meaning of it. What does grace mean? You know, um, more specifically, grace refers to Jesus Christ. Grace is what God does on your behalf. Some people have, have used the acronym grace as God's riches at Christ's expense, G-R-A-C-E. Grace is what Christ does. So grace, in the way Paul teaches it, points to Christ. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, 2, I would know nothing but Christ and him crucified, is what he preached to the Corinthians. Christ and him crucified. Okay? But if that's all Paul preached, then what about their behavior? You ever think about this? If all you preach is Christ and him crucified, and people have the picture of the cross, and they say you just preach the gospel every Sunday, then what about their behavior? But see, this, this, is, this is the teaching of grace, is that the cross not only saves you, the cross is also how you live. Okay? This is why, uh, look at Galatians 3.24. This is why the Christian life today is not referred to a life of commandment keeping or obedience to God's law. This is not the Christian life. In fact, that's contradictory. It's an oxymoron just saying that. The Christian life is living under the law or obeying God's commandments. That's, that's not the Christian life. The Christian life is a life in Christ. Okay, Galatians 3.24 verse 24. It says in verse 23, Before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. So you're in school if you're under the law. And the lesson of the school is that you can't do it. You're a sinner. You need God's help to provide for you. And that's the end of school, right? So when you graduate school, you're going, I'm a sinner, I need God, I need to trust God, he needs to provide. This is what the, the school ought to have taught you, the school of the law. And so it brings you to the point of graduation where you say, if I can't do it, and I need to trust God, and he's got to provide, you're looking for God's provision. Well, the graduation of the law, your diploma, is Jesus Christ. If you've passed the test, you understand your need for Jesus Christ. That's God in the flesh providing for you what you cannot have, okay? And that you need him to do it for you. That's grace. And so the, the law brings us to the point of Christ. If you haven't learned the lesson of the law, you're never going to see the need for Christ. You're going to think maybe Christ lived a perfect life, and so he's an example that way, that we should live a perfect life. Well, that's not what Christ was good for. Yes, he was sinless. Yes, he lived a perfect life. But that's not the reason he came. He came because humanity needed him to die for their sins. The lesson of the law brings us to Christ. Okay, Galatians 2.24. And so it says that we might be justified. Justified means to, de to be declared righteous by faith. We who are saved by Jesus Christ are declared righteous not by our works, but by faith. Not by the law, but by faith. See, the law cannot declare you righteous any longer. I know the Old Testament said it did, but God has changed his revelation now and says the law can no longer do that. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Now that Christ has come, now that the dispensation of the grace of God has been revealed, the law can no longer declare anyone righteous. So anyone thinking they're keeping any commandment, moral, ceremonial, or whatnot, for righteousness are, are deceiving themselves. Okay. Christ is your righteousness. And so thus we live a Christian life. Philippians 1 says our life is in Christ. That's what Paul describes the Christian life as being. When people look at you and say, you're a Christian, you think you're better than other people, and you say, no, I'm not. I've learned the lesson of the law. I'm not better than other people. We're all sinners, right? Well, then how do you call yourself a Christian, a saint of God? Jesus Christ is why, right? 
Show me your works. You say you have faith. Show me your works. My works were done at the cross. That's Christ's work on my behalf. It's Christ. Your life is about Christ. It's, he's the reason you live. Okay. He's the reason you will live. He's the reason you are, is Christ. This is why Paul says in Romans 6, he calls the Christian life the crucified life. You all remember Romans 6, right? Romans 6, where Paul says to reckon your flesh dead. In Galatians 2.20, where Paul teaches that you're crucified with Christ. That's the way you live today. The crucified life, as Christian writers have written before. It's not the law, uh, uh, try harder life. It's not the put more effort into it life. It's not the, go as long as you can and dirt to the end life. It's the crucified life. You say, if we take away the law, people are going to do whatever they want. Not if you live the crucified life. If you preach God's grace, which is that Christ died for you, so that when you trust in him, his death is your death, and you take part in his crucifixion, that means the way you live ought to be every day, I reckon myself dead. I'm dead with Christ. I'm crucified. My flesh is dead. If you crucify your flesh, that's much better than the law. The law feeds your flesh. The law says, here's ten commandments, do them. You say, only ten? Did it. <laughs> and your flesh feels good about that. Okay? The, the, the law provokes your flesh. But grace, instead of provoking your flesh, says your flesh can't do anything good, and you need Christ, and you're crucified in him. Well, now, it doesn't matter if there's some point or some behavior or some circumstance that isn't covered by the law. Now you're going to understand that even if the law doesn't mention anything about this circumstance, or there's a loophole in the law, or I'm trying to justify myself in the law, if you're crucified in Christ, is this a fleshly activity, or is it a godly activity? Now, now, no longer is there only 613 points of law. Now there's a million different things that are covered by this idea of you're crucified and you live a godly life. Right? So we live a crucified life. The, Paul calls in Romans chapter 8, we live a resurrected life. Okay? Why? Because Romans 6 says if you take part in Christ's death, you also take part in Christ's resurrection. And so the life you live now, as we've taught before, is the beginning of your eternity. So people have this false idea, living under the law and their thinking. The law uh, in the scripture, people put them under that. They think, well, I need to live the, my life good according to commandments. To be going to church or tithing or whatever it is. And so I need to live these things. So at the end of my life, when God judges me according to his law, then he'll judge whether I'm worthy of heaven or hell, based on how I lived. Right? And this is law teaching. This is in the Bible, folks. This is biblical. But it ignores the dispensation of God's grace. God has changed his revelation. He's revealed a mystery about salvation for the last 2,000 years and formed this church here. And he says that it's no longer you trying to live a good life so that when you die, you're judged to see if you go to heaven or hell. When you trust the gospel of the grace of God, you're already dead. That should be glory, folks. That should be peace. When you trust Christ's death on the cross, you're crucified with him. Judicially, you're dead. And judicially, you're resurrected. And so your eternal life begins right now. You see, that'll change the way you think about your life here. Because we tend to think, well, you know, those eternal things I'm going to do in eternity. <laughs> I'll study the Bible more then. I'll, I'll be more godly then. Well, why don't you start now? Because that's who you are. Yeah, that's who you are. You, you, your old man's dead. You're a new creature in Christ. You're resurrected. This is the resurrected life. This renewal of your mind into thinking that, you know what? I am living forever, starting now. <laughs> um, that investment in the future, you know. So we're, the, we're Christians. We live the Christian life. We live the crucified life. We live the resurrected life. And none of these things can be lived under the law. The law will kill you, but it won't, won't raise you from the dead. Right? The law was not Christ. Christ was Christ. He did the work for you. Right? So you see the difference here, the importance of not living uh, 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 under the law's dominion, under the law's instruction even. Okay? We operate uh, as members of the body of Christ, he being our head, and so how we live is representative of a crucified experience in our flesh and resurrected in him. Okay. Let's move on to 1 Timothy 1, verse 11 and 12 here. Paul, that's why Paul says in verse 9, we know the law is good if a man use it lawfully, but the law, folks, is... <laughs> The law is bad for you. If you're a sinner, the law is bad for you. There's no way the law is good for you. You say it's good for show, showing other people they're wrong. <laughs> That's not the way you operate in grace. Okay? It is bad for all of us. Colossians 2, Paul says that Christ nailed to the cross the ordinances that were against us. 
Yet the law is good if someone could actually keep it, if using it lawfully, but no one can. So in that way, the law is bad for us. Good in the sight of God, good and holy and just, it is, Romans 7.12, but for us, it's bad. We need Christ. That's why he says in verse 9, knowing this, we know that the law is not made for a righteous man, for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, unholy and profane, murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, for manslayers, whoremongers, then that defile themselves with mankind, men stealers, liars, perjured persons. He lists these, these horrible things here. Because that's what the law is made for. The law is made for the unrighteous. It's not made for the righteous man. Why is it made for the unrighteous man? Because they, there needs to be judgment on sin, right? Because, is there judgment on sin today? Is God judging our sins today? He's not. Romans 5, once we're at peace with God, he's not imputing trespasses unto us in this dispensation. He'll judge, us, he'll judge the future, he'll judge the world. But you've been judged at the cross when you put your faith in, in Christ's finished work, right? But to the unrighteous person, to the sinner who hasn't been saved by God's grace, to the sinner who you once were, who's trying to live their life a certain way, who's to tell them they're wrong? Right? Well, God did. <laughs> Under the law. Right? It's made for them. But once you put your trust, once you see the lesson of the law, and I need Jesus Christ to, uh, to save me from my sins, you put your trust in that, are you any longer unrighteous? What, what's Galatians 3.24 say? It was a, the law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. What does justified mean? To be declared righteous. Now, I know you're still in your flesh, you're still here, and you still have the same temptations and the sins, but you've been declared, you've been justified by faith. So you positionally are no longer an unrighteous person, you're a righteous person. He calls the Corinthians justified and righteous, and they did some bad things. But why could he do that? Because they trusted the gospel of God's grace, right? So he says, if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, all these sins are contrary to sound doctrine. Who would do these things? Okay, only sinners. Only the unrighteous, of which you know all about that, because that's what you were, all right? Verse 11, he says, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Paul here says something amazing, he says, the gospel, the grace of God. He says, teach no other doctrine. Don't teach the law. Teach grace. This is what he said back up there in verse uh, 3 and 4, right? Or 4 and 5. And he says here, if there's anything contrary to the sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which is committed to my trust, Paul's gospel is what he's mentioning here. If there's anything contrary, it's not according to my gospel. He says, that's what the law was for. Okay. But if you're believing the gospel that was entrusted to Paul, the law has no use for you. This is what he's saying. Paul says, I am proof that the law will not help your church. Okay. Paul, did Paul keep the law before he was a Christian? Yeah. He was blameless, Philippians chapter 3. A Pharisee of the Pharisees, which, by the way, was a good thing. Christians say Pharisees are Bad thing, but that's another lesson for another day. That was a good thing as a Pharisee. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was the tribe of Benjamin. He was circumcised the eighth day. He kept the law. He's blameless, zealous even. Not just kept it. I mean, he was zealous for it. He was out helping other people keep it. <laughs> that's a zealous law keeper. Those folks that follow you around. But that was Paul. Okay. And Paul says, I am proof the law will not help you grow in Christ at all. Okay. Paul was lost. Paul persecuted those who named the name of Christ. Paul injured them. He blasphemed, right? And so he says, if you teach my gospel, teach my doctrine, his gospel being the gospel of the grace of God, they'll grow in Christ. Their church will be established, right? They'll behave properly, which is what First Timothy is about, behavior in a grace church, right? They'll behave properly, understanding the Christian life. So Paul says in verse 11 here, according to the gospel, the glorious gospel, the blessed God committed to my trust. The gospel that, that God would have us believe, and, and this is what the commentators miss here, that you should not, was committed to Paul's trust. People think, well, Paul was a great missionary. He was one of the apostles, and some people even make him one of the 12 apostles. Anybody heard this before? People say, well, there were 12, and uh, then Judas, you know, sinned, and he got kicked out and died. Um, and so they needed a 12th man to replace him. 
And some people teach that the apostles messed up by putting Matthias as the twelfth man. Remember how they cast lots in Acts chapter 1 for that twelfth man? They say, well, you shouldn't have done that. That's gambling, and God's against that. And so really Paul was God's man. You know, he should have been the twelfth guy because he's a bigger celebrity than Matthias. Who's ever heard of Matthias? <laughs> Did he write a book of the Bible? Yeah. And so they think they've got a mistake. The problem with that, of course, is in Acts chapter 2, Matthias was filled with the Holy Ghost, like the other 11 apostles. And it said Peter stood up with the 11. They were all grouped together, you see. And many other reasons why Paul was not one of the 12 apostles come into play. We could talk about that. But Paul's apostleship was unique. There was a gospel committed to him. Look at 1 Corinthians. You know, I don't want to go there first. Go, look at Romans chapter 2, verse 16. There are three places in Paul's epistles where he uses this phrase, my gospel. My gospel. You ever thought about that? Why does Paul say my gospel? Why doesn't he say the gospel? Our gospel. The gospel that God, you know. He says my gospel. Now, if I stood up here and said, have you believed my gospel? <laughs> You'd go, what? What? Wouldn't you take a little take and be like, your gospel? Isn't that the gospel? You believe my gospel? As if I had a special one. That's what Paul's saying in Romans 2, verse 16. He says that God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. It's kind of bold, isn't it, Paul? I mean, uh, Paul seems to show up very late on the biblical scene of things. He, he's one of the last writers of the Bible. Why does he say it's according to his gospel that Christ is going to judge the secrets of men? Because what, because what Paul's teaching is that there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. Right? We're all sinners that need God's grace. God is not going to judge Jews different than Gentiles. Right? We know this, but it, without Paul's revel the revelation given to Paul by Christ, how would you know that? Because God made Israel a special nation and consistently gave them privileges and special mercies that no one else had. And so if you're a Jew and you had not learned the lesson of the law, which was that, you know, I need God and I can't do it myself, you may tend to think, well, I'm a Jew, and so God's going to judge me differently than you. Kind of like how some pastors think of themselves today. I'm a pastor, God's going to judge me different than you. You ever heard that? I, I, I got a brief shock from someone online a few weeks back. Uh, some charismatic Pentecostal churches teach something like that, where they have the, God's anointed being the pastor, right? So don't touch God's anointed. And, you know, if the anointed sins, it's, a, it, it, it's okay. That's why there's so much scandal in some of these churches. You say, how do people put up with the scandal, with the affairs that the pastors are involved in? How do you put up with that? Because he's God's anointed, they say. Right? He's, he's on a different level of judgment than the rest of us laymen. Right? Where do they get such an idea? When they make themselves Israel. They make themselves the special priest. Right? Well, of course, we know Paul never mentions the word priest in his epistles, and there are no priests in this dispensation. Okay? But that, that's a result of the fact that we're all equal members of the body of Christ if we're saved. I'm not in a higher position than you are. Neither are you over me. Christ is our head, and we're all members of the same body. We share an equal membership if we believe the gospel. And so Paul's gospel, my gospel, is how God will judge the secrets of men on equal terms. And you read in Romans 2, that's what he's talking about. Okay, look at Romans 16.25. Romans 16.25 here. At the end of the epistle, Paul mentions this phrase, my gospel, again. If you want to grow in God's grace today, if you want to grow up in the Lord, if you want to mature and be strengthened in this dispensation, you need to understand Paul's gospel. Of course, he didn't invent it. Christ gave it to him. So realize it's, it's really the gospel of Christ. Right? But in verse 25, he says, Now to him, that's God, who has a power to establish you according to my gospel. See that? My gospel. Why is Paul saying that? Because a special message was revealed to him that had not been revealed before. It was hidden from ages and generations past. He was the first to receive this gospel as a pattern for those that would hereafter believe. You say, you're making that up. Well, most of what I just said is quoted from Scripture. And we'll see that here in a bit. Romans 16.25 says, It's according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. Paul says Christ revealed a mystery kept secret since Genesis chapter 1. 
Okay? And he calls that my gospel. And he makes that in distinction to the other message in the Bible, which is what God had spoken since Genesis chapter 1. Okay? So it's important we understand what that means. Look at 2 Timothy 2, verse 8. Timothy 2, this is the third place Paul uses that phrase, my gospel. Many people see what Paul says here when he says my gospel, and they think it is arrogant. I say, this guy's arrogant. It's, but if you understood how Paul was saved, you wouldn't say that. If you understand the passage tonight that we're studying, you wouldn't say that. Because Paul says, don't teach the law, teach grace. Then he tells his testimony for the fourth time in the Bible. And you read his testimony, and it's all about Christ. He's saying, I'm a sinner, I was a blasphemer, I, I was wicked, I, I couldn't do anything right. And then Christ saved me. It's all Christ. But Christ gave him a ministry to do. And his ministry was to go preach to people that you can't do it on your, you're, you're a sinner, you can't do it, you need Christ to do it for you, you need Christ to save you. And what a perfect example of that Paul is. We'll see that here in a bit. The second Timothy 2, verse 8, he says, remember, verse 7 is what we have on the front of our church now on our verse board out there. Now consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Uh, consider, remembering that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Wow, that's interesting. He's even thrown in bonds as a result of that, verse 9. How is the resurrection of Christ according to Paul's gospel? Jesus mentioned it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Peter preached it in Acts 3 when Paul wasn't even saved yet. How is the resurrection of Christ according to Paul's gospel? Well, this is why. Because without the resurrection of Christ, Paul would not be an apostle at all. Without the resurrection of Christ, you'd still be in your sins. And without the resurrection of Christ is how Peter and the twelve apostles preached Jesus the entirety of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John without the resurrection of Christ. You read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the twelve apostles were ministering with Jesus on earth, and Jesus, you know, he didn't die until the end of those books. So he didn't resurrect until later. They were not preaching before he died. Trust his death and resurrection. They were preaching the gospel of the kingdom, which was the kingdom is coming, and that's the king. And so when the king dies, this is a horrible thing for them, and they're moping about. The resurrection for them was a relief, because now they can continue preaching the kingdom come. And that's what they did at Pentecost. They said, you killed him, but he's God. He rose from the dead, and it's proof that he's God. It wasn't until Paul, at the resurrection, the meaning of it is now, without the resurrection, you can't be saved. Bottom line. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. And so we know now the mystery, the secret of why Christ had to die and resurrect. It wasn't just to fulfill prophecy, which it did. It had a meaning of salvation that was kept secret that is in his death and resurrection, all men could be saved because of the work that he provided there. How do you think you have eternal life if not for Christ's resurrection? You know, there are people who rose from the dead in the, in the Old Testament. The Jews believed in resurrection, part of them, right? So they didn't need Christ to believe in resurrection. But we need Christ to be risen from the dead and eternal life if you're a sinner, you see? So Christ was raised from the dead according to Paul's gospel. But wow, the study that we can do on that. But that's not the only place Paul mentions his, his special apostleship. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9 in verse 16. I know someone's going to listen to this lesson tonight and say, well, that guy talks too much about Paul. But it's only because the Bible, the passage we're studying tonight, that's all it's talking about here. Jesus Christ saving Paul by his grace and giving Paul a special ministry and the gospel committed to Paul's trust. Why is it Paul that's put in trust? I mean, if, if Paul didn't do the work, wouldn't someone else pick up the ball? There were 12 apostles other than him, right? I mean, was Paul so arrogant to say that if I stop preaching, those 12 guys can't do anything? You know? That's what he's saying. It's committed to my trust. But that's exactly what he says in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 16. He says, Though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward, but if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. God committed a dispensation of the gospel to Paul, especially. Paul had a special gospel. It was not the preaching of the coming kingdom, it was the preaching of Christ's cross. Okay. It was not the glory of God's kingdom come to the earth, it was the glory in Christ's death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. You find that gospel in Paul's epistles alone. 
All right. This is why he says it's committed to his trust. Without Paul's epistles, take them out of your Bible. We do not have Christianity, as you know it. We're going to talk about that in our seminar coming up in December. Uh, the fundamentals of Christianity being, you know, the three-in-one God, the Jesus being deity, and the Bible, you know, that, that we have, that we learn God's word. And, you know, among these things, the resurrection of Christ being a fundamental of Christianity. Without believing these things, you can't be a Christian. One of the things you cannot, you cannot deny and be a Christian is Paul's epistles. It's not that Paul is necessary to be a Christian. It's that his books, the information God inspired in them, you rip them out of your Bible and suddenly you do not have Christianity. You have Judaism. You see? What you have is a Jewish Messiah, Messianic Jews. You put Paul's epistles back in and you have Christianity, the church, grace, the cross. Right? You have all that. There's something unique about what was revealed to him by the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 3, 1 and 2, Paul says, A dispensation of the grace of God is committed unto me. In Galatians 1, verse 8, he's, he speaks in Galatians 1, all through that chapter there, about how he didn't receive it of men, he received it from Jesus Christ himself. Okay? Titus 1, verse 3, he says it again, that the commandment was given to him. It was committed unto him. Go back to 1 Timothy 1. You, you add to this the idea that Paul's own apostleship, as I mentioned already, is a testimony of the risen Lord. If Christ did not rise from the dead, then Paul is a false witness. That's what he says in 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 15, he says, If Christ didn't rise from the dead, I am a liar. Which means we should take his books and found the Bible. Right? The fact that Paul is, or was, the fact that Paul is St. Paul, the fact that we have books written by Paul, the fact that we have 13 epistles describing this information, and Christians have just read these books is proof Jesus rose from the dead. Because there's no other way Paul would have been an apostle. He was persecuting those who named Christ until he saw the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. That's his testimony mentioned four times in the Bible. Right? If Christ didn't raise from the dead, Paul's not an apostle. And that's why everywhere Paul went, the Jews hated him. They could deal with the 12 apostles. I mean, those were guys that were around Jews, and, follow, and they were teaching the commandments and doing the law and this sort of thing. But Paul went around, and when he said, I am an apostle of Jesus Christ, they say, wait a minute. You didn't believe in Jesus while he was alive. And he says, yep, I didn't. Well, how are you an apostle of Jesus Christ? How do you say Jesus Christ sent you? Because I saw him risen, resurrected from the dead. So his own presence was a testimony that Christ rose from the dead, and they, they hated him for it. They put him in bonds for it. Okay? So, meanwhile... Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians 4. Paul says in 1 Timothy 1, there's a glorious gospel of the blessed God committed into my trust. And in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, he mentions this glorious gospel. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves. You see verse 5? What is this glorious gospel, Paul? What is this glorious gospel? Well, it's the gospel of the grace of God. You find that phrase, the gospel of the grace of God, in Acts 20, verse 28. Okay, it's Paul saying that I, I preach to you the gospel of the grace of God. You find it in Ephesians 3, where Paul says, a dispensation of, of the grace of God was given me to you. But in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 5, notice what Paul says here when he says, the glorious gospel of Christ, we preach not ourselves. That's always how the gospel begins, when you preach the gospel. If you're preaching a gospel, and it does, it's preaching of yourself, what you have to do, what you have to be, that's not the glorious gospel of the grace of God. The glorious gospel of the grace of God is, it's not me. It's not me, I don't preach myself, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. If you preach the gospel and tell someone the gospel, you say, I'm just a messenger, uh, it's not me, it's Christ, Christ saved me by his grace, and he left me here to tell you that he did that. <laughs> This is us. This is our message. Our message is not, I was a sinner, but now I'm better, and I live a righteous life because God made me, and now you can too, and your life can get cleaned up. And that's not the gospel. The gospel is, it's not me. I was a sinner. I couldn't do it. Christ did it, and he can do it for you too. You see, that's preaching Christ according to the mystery. Verse 6, you say, how can God make a sinner righteous? Well, that's the gospel of the grace of God. Read Paul's book of Romans. He says, God who commands the light to shine out of darkness, can he save a sinner? If Genesis 1, there's nothing, and God says, let there be light, can he take a sinner in which there's nothing and says, 
I'll save that guy. He can with Jesus Christ, who died for our sins. But this is what he's, he's preaching in 2 Corinthians 4 and in 1 Timothy 1. The glorious gospel committed to his trust. The gospel of the grace of God. The only gospel by which you're saved. Okay? In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12, he says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me. Paul was specially enabled. Read 1 Corinthians 15. He says, he was the last of the apostles to see Jesus. And uh, it was only by the grace of God he was able to do the ministry at all. Because he... He was, read the perils of Paul in 2 Corinthians 7. He was beaten, stoned, whipped, right? How did you endure this sort of thing? Okay? He was specially enabled, is what he says in 1 Corinthians 15. But God gave him special power. Um, of course, he had the power to heal and spiritual gifts, things like that. But there was an enablement here for him to do the ministry. God had entrusted his word to him. And God will get things done, <laughs> God was going to lay the foundation of the church whether Paul wanted to or not. That's why 1 Corinthians 9 said, if I do it not willingly, I have to anyway. God enabled him to. Okay? And it says, for that, he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Faithful for what, I ask? Counted me faithful. Did God look at Paul and say, there's a good guy to make the apostle of the Gentiles? Well, in one way, yes. But in what way? Here's a guy going around chasing people who name Jesus Christ out of their towns, hauling them off to prison. Some of them are put to death, right? That's the guy I want to be my chosen vessel. Who would choose that guy? What qualification does he have? Well, he's blameless according to the law. Yeah, but he's killing these people who name Jesus' name, right? The faithfulness here is to God's grace. If he saves that guy by his grace, who does he owe his life to? Jesus Christ. <laughs> Like, who's the chief of sinners around here? Who's my chief antagonist? Who's the chief guy who's opposed me? Who is in line to be the Antichrist? Saul. Saul. He wasn't Paul at the time. He was Saul, right? So, he, so Jesus comes to him and appears to him and says, I've chosen you, buddy. And Paul is saved by God's grace. And so Paul says, he enabled me to do ministry. He counted me faithful, knowing that I, <laughs> knowing that now, what's Paul's testimony? Is his testimony, I was living according to the law, and so I deserve to be saved by God's grace? No. He says, I was the chief of sinners, and I was saved by God's grace. I'm the only one that could have done that. God could not have given the gospel of the grace of God to the twelve apostles, because they could not teach it. That's interesting to listen to, isn't it? He could not give the gospel of grace to the twelve apostles, because they could not teach it. They were living under the Old Testament, Right? Keeping the law, or at least trying to the best they could. And when Christ came, did they reject him or receive him? They received him. Did they follow his commands or disobey his commands? They followed his commands. Did Peter walk on water or didn't he? He walked on water. Of all the people in Israel, who are those that were faithful to Jesus? The twelve. Right? At least a handful of them stuck around the cross. That's not right away. You know? They could not preach the gospel of the grace of God because they were trying to do, they were taught to do, they were told to obey the commandments I give you, and they were the ones preaching that. But Paul was not doing any of this. So only a person like Paul, like Saul at the time, you know, could God give this gospel of grace to preach because he would stand up and say, I was not doing any of that, I rejected Jesus, I um, didn't think he was the Messiah, I was one of those guys that, would have nailed him to the cross. I was at that stone, stoning of Stephen. I was carrying the people's clothes while he stoned him to death because that's how much I hated their teaching. And I'm saying, I'm a Christian. <laughs> what? I missed a step there. How did that happen? God's grace. Right? Paul tells Timothy, teach no other doctrine than what? Well, let me tell you my testimony here. <laughs> that's what Paul does. That's why it's here. Okay, the foundation of the Christian church is based on Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery given to the Apostle Paul, which is God's grace. And if a church is not built on that foundation, it's a church that will behave wrongly, self-righteously, will be condemned by the law, tore down by the law. They will not grow in God's grace. They may look pretty on the outside. Aren't we filled with churches with empty, empty insides? Yet why is that? Because Christianity today, a lot of Christians make it an outward thing. What they experience, what they feel, what law they're keeping, how good that they are. Right? It's never Christ and his grace. If it were, there wouldn't be scandals in the church. 
And I don't mean everyone's perfect. I mean when a scandal was revealed. You know, I'm not praying for people to sin. You should not sin, right? But what happens when someone sins in the church? What do you do? What's your response to it? Kick him out. We can't have sin here. You know, is that the response? Or is it, hey, we're saved by God's grace. You shouldn't sin, but God saved us by his grace. Thank the Lord. And so we can help this sinner. Right? This is the Christian response to sin. Right? But again, we'll deal with that later in 1 Timothy. Paul says, God counted me faithful. Christ counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. For no reason. <laughs> it was by grace Paul was given that. You know, in Acts 9, on the road to Damascus, it wasn't even like a matter of time. You ask people today, you know, what kind of qualifications? Paul even teaches qualifications for a minister in 1 Timothy. I mean, you don't give the, the new believer, the person just saved, the pulpit. <laughs> saved yesterday? Great. Why don't you teach us a lesson? Uh, he's not going to know anything, or he'll teach you wrong doctrine. Maybe he was taught wrong doctrine until just yesterday, and he's going to stand up and teach wrong doctrine. Right? You need right doctrine taught, which is why he's writing to Timothy and not the entire church of Ephesus about this. But Paul, when he was saved by God's grace, there's no sort of growth that he had to go through. God, by his special appointment, and this was only special to Paul, by the way, you don't have an appointment like Paul did. You follow after. Okay. But to Paul, God, as Jesus said to Ananias, he's my chosen vessel. He's my chosen vessel to preach my name to the Gentiles, the kings, and the children of Israel. All right. And that was he was still blind when Jesus said that on the road to Damascus. And so, putting him to the mystery was the first thing Christ did to Paul. Oh, isn't that abundant grace? Before he even learned the information, he gave him a position. Kind of like you. Now, you're not the apostle of the Gentiles. That, again, was special to Paul. But you were an ambassador of Jesus Christ the moment you believed the gospel. When you trusted God's grace, he crucified your old man. He gave you a position in heavenly places and said, you're my child, you're my ambassador, you're my son. And you didn't even know it. <laughs> you didn't even know it yet. Until someone told you from the scripture, that's what you are now. Right? And he gave you all that for free, freely, by God's grace, Romans 3 says. You don't earn it, you don't deserve it, you just have it. Right? You're a member of Christ's body. What did I do to get there? You did nothing to get there. Christ put you there when you trusted the gospel. Okay? Paul says in 1 Timothy 1, verse 13, who was before a blasphemer, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. Notice the three words there at the beginning of that verse. Who was before. Right? People teach a gospel as if you need to repent and turn from your sins and then trust Christ on the cross. If you're going to turn from your sins before you get saved, then the person who says that they're saved under that gospel, I'll show you a self-righteous person. Okay? Yeah, I've repented, I've turned from my sins, I'm ready to receive the gospel. Nope. What was the lesson of the law again? The lesson of the law was you can't do it. You see? You were before a sinner. You were before, Paul says, a blasphemer, persecutor, and injurious, but I obtained mercy. Mercy is given to people who don't deserve it. That's what mercy is. Okay? They don't deserve it. That's why you give them mercy. If they deserved it, it wouldn't be mercy. It'd be, they deserve that. <laughs> you see? Mercy, grace, is given to people who don't deserve it. Some people say, well, they don't deserve to be kind to them, to be gracious. Being, the definition of being kind and being gracious means the other person doesn't deserve it. Otherwise, you're just acting normal. You see? I'm not giving it to them. They don't deserve it. Paul didn't deserve it. You didn't deserve it. God gave it to you. He says, I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. You know, ignorance is no excuse. Um, under the law, it wasn't. You broke the law under the law. You break the law today. You try driving home 100 miles an hour, and the cop pulls you over. You say, I didn't know. Didn't know the speed limit. Didn't look at the sign, you know. No excuse. Here's a ticket. Next time you know. <laughs> um, ignorance is not an excuse. Okay. Um, Paul says, I did it ignorantly in unbelief, telling us that he was ignorant of Christ being Christ, of Jesus being Christ. He obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief, but it didn't mean he deserved it. His ignorance was not justification for his salvation. He was just telling his state. Okay. 
1 Timothy 1, verse 14 is what we're at. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. So he was before a blasphemer, persecutor, injurious, but now the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. The grace of our Lord. He doesn't say, and now I'm much better and I live a perfect life and my sins are, you know, I, I don't sin anymore. You know, I've turned over a new leaf. No, he says the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant. The cross reference to this verse is Romans 5 verse 20. Paul is talking here not only about himself, and this is something to recognize, because a lot of commentators only think that Paul's talking about his personal conversion, as if you and I would give, say, no, give our testimonies, which would, may sound similar about grace and this sort of thing, even though you're not on the road to Damascus and you weren't blinded, you didn't see the Lord Jesus personally. But you may have a similar grace testimony as Paul, and I hope you do. In fact, all of you that are saved have a grace testimony, otherwise you're not saved. But Romans 5, verse 20 He's talking also here in a bigger perspective about a change in God's dealing with humanity. Because as we mentioned at the beginning of the outline, he was operating in the world through the law. He was operating in the world through the Old Testament, under which Jesus lived. Jesus was born, lived, and ministered under the Old Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It wasn't until his death that anybody can say a New Testament could even begin. But even Peter and the Twelve Apostles were preaching the prophecies and what the law and the Psalms taught about what should come. So here's the Twelve preaching at Pentecost under their law system. You know, the New Covenant was also a law written in their hearts. But when Paul says that he started persecuting, and here's Paul in our Bible, and he's, he was persecuting these guys, he was against them. And he says, on that road to Damascus, God saved him. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and faith and love was abundant towards him. He's saying something changed here. In Romans chapter 5, he explains the dispensational change. In verse 20, he says, The law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. What's he saying? Where the law was, sin was in abundance, right? And so you have the law in operation here. When Paul says, God saved me by his grace, he's testifying not only of his salvation of grace, but of the, the changing way in which God is now dealing with the world. He says, grace is now reigning. Paul's conversion was a testimony that grace is more powerful than sin, right? Because of, of his sin. Grace that God gave to Paul was a sign, which is why he repeats his testimony, was a witness, was a pattern of the grace that God would now offer and show to everyone that hereafter believed. It was a change in dispensation. They were under the law, but now, Paul tells his testimony of grace. He says, grace abounds, Romans 5 verse 20. Grace did much more abound. When did the grace start abounding like that? It started abounding right here. Okay? The work that Christ accomplished here was revealed here. Okay? You don't find anywhere in Acts chapter 2 where Peter preaches the death and resurrection of Christ as ministered by grace to all men on the earth. You don't read it at all. Peter addresses Jews. He tells them to repent and be baptized. He tells them to keep the law. He tells them to sell everything they have, and he quotes the prophecies to do it. Peter doesn't know the preaching of the cross in Acts chapter 2 that Paul knows. It's not because he's dumb. It's not because Paul's smarter. It's because Christ hadn't revealed it yet. Christ revealed it to Paul. And grace abounded. We come after all of that, of course. And this is what 1 Timothy 1 is all about here. 1 Timothy 1 is about Paul's conversion, the message of God's grace being the foundation, being the doctrine, the gospel that, Paul, that Timothy is supposed to lay as a foundation in his church. Okay. Paul has a pattern in verse 14, or uh, 15 rather, says, This is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Paul calls himself the chief of sinners, which is strange because he kept the law, didn't he? <laughs> chief of sinners. Why was he the chief of sinners? What's it mean to be chief? Does this mean he committed more sins than anybody else? No, that's not what that means. Chief means a position, a beginning, 
He was the chief of sinners to be saved by God's grace. Look at his testimony, right? The sin he was committing was he was against Christ. He was persecuting these people, right? Jesus said, if you reject me, you reject the Father. Jesus says, you reject me, you'll die in your sins. Jesus says, if you don't follow me into the kingdom, you're going to be burned up. That's what Stephen preached in Acts 7, too, right? That's what Paul was doing. Paul was rejecting Jesus. He was on the road to hell, even though he was a Jew. So Paul says, I'm the chief of sinners. I'm the beginning of something new here. Because in the next verse, he says, I'm the chief of sinners, but I'm the first to be shown all long suffering. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. That verse should be squared and highlighted and starred in your Bible. This is an amazing verse. Because that shows you the beginning of how anyone could be saved like you are saved today. If you're saved by God's grace, it's because of what Christ started with the Apostle Paul when he saved him by his grace on the road to Damascus, making him a pattern. Christ is our Lord, but Paul is our pattern. How is that? It's because Christ is God. Paul is not. That's the only way he can be our pattern. Paul was a sinner, the chief of sinners, saved by God's grace. And what are you? Are you closer to God or are you closer to sinners needing to be saved by God's grace? See, there's the pattern, right? If you go back here and say, oh, the red letters are my pattern. I need to follow Jesus. There's things you can't do. He's God. Can you be baptized without sin? Jesus was. Can you keep all the commandments perfectly? Jesus did. Can you die on the cross for someone else's sins? Jesus did. You can't follow Jesus in his perfect life and sinless existence. You need a pattern of salvation by grace through faith. That's what Christ presented when he saved Paul. Okay? This is a pattern for the church. And so, Paul says, in me first. He is the first in the body of Christ, this new creature. As Paul explains in Ephesians 3, 6, the mystery revealed to him is this one body made of Jew or Gentile. It doesn't matter if you're a sinner, if you were under the law before, if you were a Jew or not a Jew. If you're a person... You're a sinner and need God's grace. You can trust Jesus Christ on the cross <clears throat> and you'll be saved. Right? He's the first in that. He's the first to preach the mystery of Christ. He's the first to glory in the cross. Before him, when the cross happened, people, that's, that was not hanging around people's necks at Pentecost. They wouldn't have done it. Okay? Because that was a wicked thing they did. Paul glories in it. Paul says, that cross is my life. Right? What he did is my life. And so, he's the first to preach that. He's the first in time. 1 Timothy 1.16 says, he's the first that those which should hereafter believe, hereafter what? Hereafter this point. That's where you're at. You're over here. Right? You hereafter believe after Paul's pattern. You didn't know who Paul was when you got saved. Maybe not. But you got saved the same way he did. Right? And so it's first in time. It's first in place. In 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10, Paul says, I am the master builder. The church was revealed to the Apostle Paul. The, the instructions, the nature, the, the, the makeup, the doctrine, the, the, the practice of the church is given to the Apostle Paul. And Paul says, I lay a foundation. And everyone who comes after me builds on this foundation. What's his foundation? Jesus Christ. His grace. It's according to the mystery. And we're building on that. Paul says he's the master builder. Paul doesn't say I'm one of many builders. He says I'm the master builder in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10. Because it was given to him to do that, do that function in ministry. He's given authority in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 5. People, there's 1.3 billion people follow a church that claim authority going all the way back to the first century. People argue about that, and that's not even my biggest hang-up. <laughs> My biggest hang-up is not apostolic succession. My biggest hang-up is their apostle is Peter. Imagine tracing your lineage for 2,000 years and you got the wrong apostle. That, that's the problem. Okay? If we can trace apostolic succession all the way back to Paul, I'd be like, great. Because you know what? We wouldn't have a pope in that case. Right? Paul wasn't a pope. Paul didn't teach to have a pope. Paul says we're all equals members of the body of Christ. If we can trace our church all the way back to Paul, I'd love it. Can't. Right? There's not a church that can but we have the same gospel, you see. But in 2 Corinthians 11, look what Paul says about the other apostles. He says, they don't have any more authority than me. He that, uh, verse 5, 
I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles. Who's the chiefest? Who do you like? Who do you think has the most authority? Peter? John? You want to choose James? Right? Any of those guys? He says, I'm not a whit behind any of them. Uh, concerning what? The authority that Christ gave him to minister. Because Christ gave Paul a message that was different than the message he gave to Peter and the twelve apostles. They're preaching two different messages. They're not conflicting with each other. One's not trying to beat the other. They're both preaching Christ, one according to prophecy, here. One according to mystery, here. One in Israel, here. One among Gentiles, here. You see? In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, in verse 11, Paul says, I became a fool in glorying. Ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you, for a nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. People say, Paul's arrogant. He's not arrogant. Listen to what he's saying. He says, my office, my position, Jesus Christ gave me a responsibility. He says, you need to recognize this. But he says, I'm nothing. In myself, I am nothing. Though I be nothing, I have the authority not behind any of the other apostles. Right? So he's first in authority. If you're claiming Paul's apostleship and the message he preaches, you're not lacking anything. Okay? Paul says so much. Consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things. He says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and profitable, that the man of God may be perfect, complete, thoroughly furnished. Right? He's first in importance. In Romans eleven thirteen, 13, Paul says, I am the apostle of the Gentiles. Are you a Gentile? There's only one apostle that was sent to Gentiles, and that's the apostle Paul. The other 12 were sent to Israel. And he says, I magnify my office, his office, the position he had, not his self. Read his testimony in 1 Timothy 1, 11 through 16. His testimony is, it's not me. It's Christ. But his office, his responsibility was so important. Okay. He's first in priority in Galatians chapter 2, verse 6. He says, of those who seem to be somewhat in Jerusalem, he went to Jerusalem and those who seem to have some authority, he says, whatsoever they were, maketh no matter to me, God accepts no man's person. Oh, that's the gospel of grace coming out there. Right? Was there a respect of persons at Pentecost? Think about it. Peter only talked to Jews, not to Gentiles. Ye men of Israel, he says. And then, when they had a few thousand believers in Israel, and they did what Jesus said, selling all their possessions, having all things in common, whose feet did they lay them down at? The apostles. Right? The twelve apostles. In Matthew 19, 28, what did Jesus say about these twelve guys? He said, I'll put you on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Those twelve men had special dominion over twelve tribes of Israel, over the nations of the world. Paul goes there and says, whoever they are, didn't make a difference to me. God respects no man's person today. He says, today, as God reveals his grace today in this dispensation, those twelve apostles and their twelve thrones are not reigning today. So when Peter comes to Paul's Galatia church, Paul says, you can't preach that stuff here. Right? Wow! What arrogance! Or rather, is it obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ? Because Christ revealed to him a message that Peter didn't know. But Galatians 2, 6, Paul says, For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me, but contrary wise, he said something they didn't know. Galatians 2, verse 7. Okay? So Paul says, in me first. Well, in what way is he first? And people look at that and they say, well, the Greek word there is really chief. It doesn't mean the first in time. It means chief. Like the chief of sinners, he's the chief. Well, chief of what? I mean, that's still an important thing. We've already seen he's the first in authority for this dispensation. He's the first to hold that office of the Gentiles. He's the first to have the revelation of the mystery given to him. People say, well, the other apostles knew it too. Ephesians 3, verse 5, it says... In other ages, the mystery was not made known in the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles. Plural. It's true. It says plural apostles. But Paul says it is now revealed. He doesn't say it was revealed. He says it's now revealed. Paul was the first and only person to write that. Even if Peter knew it when he was a baby, which he didn't, even if Peter knew it when he was a baby, we don't know that, do we? The only way we know about the mystery of Christ, the gospel of God's grace, is to read what God inspired through Paul's epistles. So, you see, Paul's significant as an apostle. And that's why he's telling Timothy here, I'm not trying to glorify the man, 
Because the man, when he testifies of his salvation, glorifies Christ. But Paul says three times, follow me as I follow Christ. 1 Corinthians 4.15, you have not many fathers, I am your father, he says. Right? And spiritually, in the gospel, he gave him the gospel. 1 Corinthians 11, he says, follow me as I follow Christ. And their behavior. In Philippians chapter 3, he says, be ye followers of me. Because of the message that he has. Because in Philippians 3, that same chapter, he says, I want to know Jesus Christ and his sufferings and his death and his resurrection. Follow me, is what he says. Follow me in the crucified life, not under the law. Follow me in the resurrected life, not under the law. And in 1 Timothy 1, he tells Timothy, remember my testimony? This is your foundation. He's no other doctrine than the gospel of the grace of God. Right? So Paul says that he's the last of all, and he says he's the least of the apostles in 1 Corinthians 15, but he also says he's the pattern, and he has the purpose He's the first for the church, the body of Christ. To make all men see the fellowship of the mystery, Ephesians 3, verse 9. Right? To preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, Ephesians 3, verse 8. He calls himself the least and the last, but then he, Christ made him the pattern and gave him the purpose. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? That sounds just like Jesus, actually, because Jesus would always say, the first should be last, the last should be first. And then what's he do? The first thing he gets to heaven, you know, a little while after he gets to heaven, he gets to this person who's the last of all and the least of all sinners, you know, least of the apostles and the chief of sinners. And he says, you're going to be the guy to whom I reveal my secret since the world began. The last will be first, the first will be last. That's just perfect. That's just like the Lord. Praise God. Praise Jesus Christ for that. Right. If Christ would have given the most holy Dalai Lama or most righteous Pope that message, would that have the same effect? It wouldn't. We'd be like, well, I'm not like Mother Teresa. You know, she's Mother Teresa, I'm not. But what can we say now? He gave it to Paul, and Paul, he was the chief of sinners. Well, he, he, if he got it, yeah, I'm a sinner, I could be saved too. You see the picture? And so, he says, follow me. Paul is a pattern. In 1 Timothy 1, verse 16, he's a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him, on Christ, to life everlasting, now unto the King eternal. It's all about Jesus Christ here. When you follow Paul, you follow Christ. When we preach the apostleship of Paul, we're preaching Christ. No one speaks more about Christ than the apostle Paul. Okay? He says, unto the king eternal. Christ is eternal. He's immortal. He's invisible. The only wise God. Be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And that's, of course, written after Paul just explains his salvation testimony. Not about him. He doesn't preach himself. He preaches Christ. And that's the foundation of the church. Any questions? Any comments? About 1 Timothy 1, 11 through 16. Christ refers to him as the king. The Bible does. Yeah, I know that we dispensationalists make a distinction between the kingdom and the church and Christ being the king. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's good to know that because, uh, you know, Colossians 1, for example, Paul says that we're in the kingdom of his son. And Paul preaches the kingdom. So you need to know when we make a distinction between the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of grace, there. Paul uses these words as well, and we need to know why he uses them. Christ is still the king. He's just not reigning as the king on the earth right now. But he, he has that position. He's the all in all. He's the prince of peace. He's the, every title the Bible gives him is rightfully his. But God is doing something today that it's different than what he was doing before. And what he will do in the future when he returns as king to the earth is different than what he's doing now. We don't live in the prophesied kingdom now. Christ isn't the king on the earth. We're voting for Trump or Clinton. <laughs> what we know is Christ isn't here. <laughs> That's evident. Yeah. In the lesson, uh, you were talking about the point on the outline that says we no longer live by the law, but by Christ's crucifixion and resurrection. You made the comment how without Christ's resurrection, we don't have eternal life. Mm -hmm. It's true. And what occurred to me is that in contrast, uh, Israel could claim resurrection without knowing anything about Christ's resurrection because it was promised to them. That's right. And yeah. So that's another reason why we need Christ's resurrection for our eternal life because we have, we as Gentiles, no we promise. Have no promise. promise of resurrection. Exactly right. Yeah. So it's, it's just one other reason. Uh, Paul doesn't mention that in his First Corinthians argument, but it's another reason why we need yeah. Christ's resurrection because. The Jews were promised that. They didn't need Christ's resurrection yep. or their yep. resurrection, but we need it for us. I love it. I love it how it fits because I mean, that, that's the, the whole Hebrews book that we study verse by verse. Yep. I mean, what's the difference between Israel's salvation and our salvation? You know, well, Israel was promised salvation. Promise we were never promised.
And so their salvation was wrapped up in God's obligation to save them. And of course, they had to have faith in, in this sort of thing. But we, having no promise as Gentiles, must depend on Jesus Christ. And that's so perfect, because he, the message we preach is Jesus Christ today. We're not preaching the law and the kingdom. So uh, it totally makes sense. That also helps the whole eternal security and losing your salvation argument. That will help with that. Because you find verses that it looks like they can lose their salvation. Well, how? Because they were promised salvation, but they didn't endure to the end to receive the promise. If you were never promised salvation, you can't get it and lose it and get it and lose it. If you weren't never promised, either got it or you don't. Right? But both of those are taught in the Bible. And if you don't rightly divide, then you're going to pick one randomly. Yeah, so, but, yeah. Any other questions? Any comments? Yes, sir. Is that at the same time, Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise to Israel? Yeah. So, even though they had the promise of resurrection, it still doesn't work without Christ. That's right. Christ being the fulfillment of God's promise to them. That's right. The means by which God can... Right. Fulfill. Well, again, that, that's how the, when Paul said, according to my gospel, he rose from the dead, and how we're judged according to my gospel. I, both of those things are, are including Israel into this, um, but the mystery un unveils the secret even of how God can save Israel. But yeah, you're right. So, you know, Christ, it can, it's not as if Christ could stay away and Israel could still be resurrected, but their promise required something happen, right? So, you know, in Israel's promise, God said, you will be, I, I promise you blessing and salvation and resurrection. And if Christ did not come, God would be a liar, right? So Christ had to come for Israel's sake, but... He had to come because he promised. He had to come for our sake because we'd be lost without him. So, you know, it's just a different, different reason, but yeah. Is, is how it's preached, because Peter was preaching resurrection in Acts 2. Mm -hmm. As you pointed out, it was simply to point out that his gospel message remains true because the king is still alive. Yeah. That was, that's how he was preaching resurrection. He in no way tied Jesus' resurrection to, well, because Jesus resurrected, now we all get to resurrect into the kingdom. I mean, he, he, I don't think... He wasn't making that connection doctrinally, you know, as far as that goes. Uh, clearly, it's by Jesus Christ that those things happen. But I think in, in reference to how, how the resurrection is preached and how, how the Jews would have viewed Christ's resurrection is much different how, than how we would and how we do view it. Certainly. Any other comments?